Hello YouTube! Today I'm going to examine moral disagreement. In particular we'll look at how moral disagreement challenges moral realism. The argument from moral disagreement is probably the standard argument against moral realism among laypersons, but it seems to me it's not considered to be a particularly serious problem by professional philosophers. So we'll examine various ways in which disagreement might pose a problem for realism and we'll see whether there is any challenge here that actually holds up. Um, first of all, though, we need to specify what exactly is moral realism. Um, I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you at least have a basic understanding of metaethics. If not, you can go and watch my video series on metaethics. But it's worth specifying uh, just from the start what we take moral realism to be. So as I'm using the term, moral realism is the view that moral judgments express propositions, that some of these propositions can be known to be true, and that the true moral propositions are made true in virtue of objective facts. Uh, to say that moral facts are objective is to say that they are not determined by the opinions of particular individuals or societies. The, you know, that, so the moral facts are not dependent on our opinions about them. Uh, essentially, the moral realist is committed to holding that, in principle, everybody might be wrong about what the moral facts are. In the same way that everybody might be wrong about you know, the question of how the solar system was created or the question of what is the tallest mountain on earth. So if we take the judgment slavery is wrong, well, the moral realist will treat this judgment as expressing a proposition. It, it, it attributes the property of wrongness to slavery. You know, it's not simply an expression of emotion or expression of a command or whatever. Secondly, this proposition is true and known to be true. And third, the truth of this proposition is in some sense objective. Slavery is wrong and slavery would still be wrong even if everybody believed that slavery was acceptable. So the statement slavery is wrong is in these respects analogous to a statement like Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on earth. A true proposition known to be true independent of people's opinions. Okay so there are different ways of defining moral realism but I think this sums up the basic idea and with that said we can specify the argument from disagreement. Uh, the standard form of the argument is something like this. If moral realism were true, there would be relatively little moral disagreement, but there is lots of moral disagreement, so moral realism is false. Uh, it's a well-known fact that moral codes vary considerably from one society to another, uh, even from one individual to another within the same society. Uh, many people think that this has consequences for uh, moral realism. If there were moral facts and we could have knowledge of these moral facts, we wouldn't expect to see this kind of disagreement. Um, that's the basic idea. Uh, well, there are two points that are worth noting uh, right off the bat. First, moral disagreement is often taken not simply as an argument against moral realism, but as an argument for moral relativism. Uh, moral relativism is the view that there are moral truths, but that they are true only relative to the moral codes of particular cultures or particular individuals. And no moral code uh, can be shown to be objectively superior to any other. Now, I'm not going to discuss moral relativism in too much detail here. Asserting moral, moral relativism is a much stronger claim than rejecting moral realism, because relativism is just one among many ways to reject realism, right? So an argument for relativism is an argument against realism, but not vice versa. Um, and in any case, relativism itself faces a host of objections. It's a fairly unpopular position among professional philosophers. So we're just going to focus on disagreement as a challenge to realism rather than as a reason for relativism. Second point, uh, importantly, is that the existence of disagreement doesn't in itself logically entail that moral realism is false. Um, after all, the realist could just hold that people with different moral views are incorrect. That's a fairly natural assumption because we encounter plenty of disagreement in other contexts where we don't see this disagreement as threatening realism. Um, so yeah, the, the fact that in some societies people believe the earth is flat uh, that does nothing to challenge real realism about the spherical Earth. The Earth is an oblate spheroid, we know it's an oblate spheroid, and people who think otherwise are just mistaken. So, um, you know, we we're going to have to do more work with this argument. Uh, certainly, you know, we can't just assume that moral disagreement in itself shows that moral uh, realism is false. Now, it turns out there isn't just one argument from disagreement, there are many. And I'll be drawing here on David Enoch's article, 
how, how is moral disagreement a problem for moral realism? Enoch goes through a variety of disagreement arguments um, and we will do the same. I'm going to change, change the presentation slightly in some cases, but um, yeah, I'm drawing substantially on that article. So one type of disagreement argument, again, quite popular among lay persons, is an appeal to tolerance. Um, some people consider moral realism to be an arrogant position, dismissive of the values of other cultures. Moral realism commits us to the view that the values and convictions of other cultures are inferior to ours, that we are better than other cultures. Uh, Enoch summarises the tolerance argument as follows. In cases of cross-cultural disagreement, it would be intolerant to suppose that we are right and the others wrong. We ought not to be intolerant. So in cases of cross-cultural disagreement, we ought not claim that we are right and the other culture is wrong. So in such cases, it is not correct that we are right and the other culture wrong. So in such cases, there's no objective fact of the matter, no objective moral truth. And that is just to deny moral realism. Now, there are several obvious problems with this kind of argument. First of all, Enoch says it conflates theoretical reasons and practical reasons. We are interested in the question of whether moral realism is true. Even if it would be intolerant to hold moral realism or to express moral realism or whatever, um, that's clearly compatible with it being true. Uh, it, it, may not, it may not be particularly tactful to insist that other cultures are simply wrong, but they may nevertheless just be wrong, right? Um, so, so Enoch says more precisely there is an ambiguity in the use of the term ought in the argument above. In premise two, the ought is a practical or moral ought. Um, you know, when, when we say that people ought not to be intolerant, that's a moral claim. But we can only derive the anti-realist conclusion by treating the ought of premise three as an epistemic ought, um, as saying that there is some epistemic flaw in supposing that we are right and the other culture wrong. Uh, so the, the argument trades on this uh, ambiguity. Another problem here is that if you buy this argument, you seem to be committed to rejecting realism across the board in many other domains that you probably want to be a realist about. After all, different cultures also have different beliefs about, for example, the origin of the world. If it would be intolerant to claim that we are right about what the moral facts are, wouldn't it similarly be intolerant in just the same way to claim that we are right about what the facts are concerning the origin of the earth? But few people are prepared to go that far in, in the name of tolerance. Well, I, I guess there are fewer people prepared to do that than people who are prepared to be moral anti-realists, right? Um, now, I mean, maybe there is some relevant difference between moral disputes and these other disputes that would make intolerant in the moral case but not in the other case but uh, the defender of this argument will need to spell out what this difference is supposed to be. I mean actually it, seem, it seems to me that another very deep problem with this argument is just that well, like, you know, why? Why exactly would it be intolerant to say that another culture has the moral facts wrong? I mean speaking for myself I don't tend to think of disagreements in these terms. When somebody says that I'm wrong about something I don't feel like they're being intolerant towards me. That that seems like kind of an absurd reaction. Um, so yeah, a lot of things wrong with this kind of argument. A second argument appeals to the idea of self-evidence. The thought here is that if moral realism is true, there are certain basic moral principles that should be self-evident. So I mean, basically the argument goes like this. If moral realism is true, the moral facts are self-evident or easily deducible from self-evident principles. Um, and if the moral facts are self-evident or easily deducible from self-evident principles, there will be very little disagreement about these facts, but there is lots of moral disagreement, so moral realism is false. If it were an objective fact that slavery is wrong, then it would be obvious to almost everybody that slavery is wrong. But in fact, we find substantial disagreement about this. Many people historically, even many smart, careful thinkers, thought that slavery was acceptable. So there's no objective fact about the moral status of slavery. Now, um, I guess premise two seems fair enough. Um, it's, it's hard to see how we could insist that something is self-evidently true uh, 
if there's significant disagreement about it. Uh, I guess examples of self-evident truths would be things like one plus one equals two, or claims about one's immediate sensory experience, like there is a blue cup in front of me, or at least maybe something like I am currently experiencing a patch of blueness or something like that. Um, these are things, you know, the, the statements that everybody accepts can plausibly be thought of as self-evident. Arguably. The, the problem with the argument, obviously, is premise one. Um, there are almost no moral realists who think that the moral facts are self-evident or easily deducible from self-evident principles. Uh, maybe there are some very basic moral values that are self-evident. Um, you know, cooperation is good, fairness is good, and so on. Uh, but on those points, there's arguably little disagreement, or at least there's certainly less disagreement um, than, than in other cases. You know, once you get to the more substantive moral claims, nobody expects them to be self-evident. Okay, a third disagreement argument uses inference to the best explanation. This is most famously proposed by J. L. Mackey in his defense of moral error theory in his book Ethics, Inventing Right and Wrong. The claim is that some form of anti-realism is the best explanation for the patterns of disagreement we find with, uh, with morality. Mackey says, and I quote, The actual variations in the moral codes are more readily explained by the hypothesis that they reflect ways of life than by the hypothesis that they express perceptions, most of them seriously inadequate and badly distorted, of objective values. Our moral values are instilled in us primarily by our culture and upbringing. What makes one person approve of monogamy over other types of relationships is that they have just participated in a monogamous culture, not that they have detected the objective moral value of monogamy. Um, so Enoch uh, formalises the argument as follows. There is lots of disagreement about moral matters, the best explanation for such disagreement is that moral opinions do not track the objective facts, but simply reflect different ways of life. Therefore, moral opinions do not track the objective facts. And this, of course, is just to say that moral realism is false. If moral opinions do not track the objective facts, then we're not justified in thinking that any of our moral beliefs are true. Um, I mean, one point here is that the moral realist has uh, this has a kind of explanatory burden, right? The, the moral realist has to explain why exactly other cultures get the facts wrong. If we claim that we have got the moral facts right, we must suppose that there is something special about us that has allowed us to perceive and reason about the moral values better than others. But what could this be? Why are the moral facts hidden from so many people? Why are so many cultures fundamentally wrong in the basic values that they hold? Uh, the anti-realist obviously has no such burden. The anti-realist expects substantial disagreement. Um, you know, be because those cultures aren't detecting objective moral facts, um, that there are just different ways of life and that gives rise to different values. Um, now, important point here is Mackey uh, himself notes that it, disagreement in itself is not the issue here. It, it, disagreement in itself isn't, isn't the problem. There's plenty of disagreement in domains that we want to be realists about. Uh, we've already noted disagreement about the origin of the earth. Similarly, in you know, physics, astronomy, biology, all these other fields, we can find societies with radically different views to our own. But the point is that in these cases, we can explain the disagreement in a way that is compatible with us reliably detecting the facts. Um, it's compatible with there being something special about us that means that we reliably get at what the facts are. Uh, and, the, and the key difference is that in these cases, the disagreement arises from the fact that our beliefs are based on, um, as Mackey says, speculative inferences and explanatory hypotheses based on inadequate evidence. So, people disagree about the origin of the Earth because this requires us to figure out the causal processes that were at work long ago in the past, and those facts are very difficult to access. Um, morality is a domain relevant in everyday life. It concerns the regulation and coordination of behaviour. Moral judgments are not at least according to Mackey, speculative, explanatory, causal hypotheses. Um, and our, our basic moral values do not seem to be open to empirical investigation, um, which means it's much more difficult to explain why we would be able to detect the moral facts while others couldn't. Maybe one way to look at it is like this. 
Once we have discovered the facts about the origin of the Earth, we can fairly easily explain why people found this discovery so difficult. Um, we can certainly explain why people living in other societies without access to the advanced technology of our society and without knowledge of sophisticated theoretical developments in the relevant fields were unable to uncover these facts. In order to discover how the Earth was formed, we had to discover, for example, the composition of the stars. And this required the instruments of spectroscopy and the development of the periodic table and so on. So this explains why people in the past did not know the origin of the Earth. You know, we, we can specify something special about our culture that allows us to access the facts, whereas others couldn't. But now on discovering the moral fact that slavery is wrong, how do we explain why people in the past, or in other societies, couldn't discover this fact. Uh, and it's not obvious what the realists should say here, right? Um, by contrast, the anti-realist av avoids this, this explanatory burden, right? The, because the anti-realist says, well, we, we didn't discover the fact that slavery was wrong, it's just that our values changed. So the anti-realist explanation for the patterns of disagreement, Mackie thinks, uh, is, is superior to the realist explanation. Okay, Enoch's um, main objection to this argument is that there are a variety of alternative explanations friendly to realism which are just as plausible as the anti-realist explanation. So um, he thinks the anti-realist explanation is not the best explanation for moral disagreement. Um, Enoch says that moral realists can appeal to a number of factors to explain disagreement, uh, and uh, here are some of them. So first of all, moral debates are often very complex. They involve um, sophisticated theoretical and empirical aspects. To take the example of slavery, it took so long to achieve a consensus on this because it required both um, empirical developments in biology, showing that all races are relevantly similar in terms of rationality and intelligence, and also theoretical developments concerning you know, equality of rights and things like that. Uh, second, people have a number of cognitive biases and other shortcomings which will impact their moral reasoning. This is just a general problem, but it, you know, it, it arises obviously in moral debates as well. Third, people find it hard to empathise with others, to imagine different perspectives. In particular, people find it hard to imagine what it's really like to occupy a different position uh, in the relevant interaction with respect to a moral debate. Many of the people who defended slavery probably found it difficult, or perhaps just didn't, didn't even bother trying, to see things from the point of view of the slaves. Fourth, uh, we often allow our interest to influence our beliefs, and this is especially the case with moral beliefs, because these act as constraints on our behaviour. Obviously it was in the self-interest of many people to hold that slavery was morally acceptable. Uh, anybody who owned slaves faced the prospect of either giving up a significant source of wealth or considering themselves morally evil, um, you know, if, if they were to endorse the moral badness of slavery. And of course, in general, people are averse to challenging the status quo. If you live in a society with slavery, you won't want to, to view significant numbers of your countrymen as morally evil or to think that your society needs to radically change. Um, and there are many other points we might raise here, but I, I think you can see the, the basic idea. All of these reasons and more can be used by the realist to explain just how it is that moral disagreement arises, even if there are objective moral facts. Um, and I mean, importantly, moral disputes are going to be subject to these kinds of effects far more strongly than other kinds of disputes. When we look at debates about, say, the, com the chemical composition of the stars, well, the people taking part in that debate don't really have much at stake concerning their, their interests, nor does it really matter whether they're good at empathising with others, nor is any answer likely to pose any challenge to the status quo in their society. Um, so the realist can give a good explanation of why moral disagreements seem different from many empirical disagreements. Now, of course, there is an obvious worry here, which is that the points raised by the realist will threaten the justification for the realist's own moral beliefs because the realist is also going to be subject to cognitive biases. She's also going to be subject to the distorting effects of self-interest and so on. So the realist is going to need to show that her circumstances are such as to mitigate these distorting effects. 
Um, but there are plausible things that we might say here. Uh, the norms of discourse within the philosophical literature, for example, seem quite well placed to avoid these distorting influences and to, to mitigate these distorting influences. Philosophers are expected to locate relevant conceptual distinctions, to identify cognitive biases and avoid them, to evaluate arguments disp dispassionately and so on. Um, I mean, we can never remove these kinds of problems entirely, but it does seem plausible that there are contexts where they're going to be mitigated. Um, another response the realist can make to um, the inference to the best explanation argument is that it's not just disagreement that we need to account for. An explanation of moral disagreement also needs to capture all of the other relevant facts about the patterns of moral beliefs, and there are certain patterns, the realist might argue, that tend to favour a realist account. So we also need to give an account for uh, convergence over time, and in particular convergence among expert opinion. For example, uh, one, one, one case of convergence is that we find what's sometimes called an expanding circle of moral concern. So the extension of moral concern first to the people of one's own tribe, then to men of a particular race and class, then to, you know, all of the people of that race, then to all classes, then to all women, and perhaps to animals, as seems to be happening right now. Um, you know, the, 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 the people who are, the entities that are considered worthy of moral um, status gradually expands. Um, and there's been a, an increasing convergence on that. Like, nobody really doubts these days, well, I mean, I guess there's always going to be some people, but no sensible person doubts these days that you know, women are worthy of equal moral consideration to men. Um, so the, the realist might argue that this kind of pattern of convergence is best explained by people coming to converge on the moral facts as societies start to overcome the kinds of biases that we have just noted. Uh, as societies become more literate, more educated, uh, more interconnected, so that people from different walks of life engage with each other, we see an expanding circle of moral concern, an increasing concern for individual rights and liberties, and so on. And the realist might say that that's uh, more plausibly explained by a convergence of belief in, in the objective moral facts. A fourth version of the argument from disagreement is the semantic argument. Consider two societies, Society A and Society B. Both of these societies use seemingly moral terms. We might suppose that they both speak English and they both use the term morally good to commend behaviour, they both use the term morally wrong to disapprove of it, and so on. However, the moral standards of each society are very different. Perhaps in Society A, people tend to be socially liberal utilitarians, whereas in Society B, people tend to be socially conservative Kantians. So the range of actions labelled morally wrong by one society is very different from the range of actions labelled morally wrong by the other. Now, the suggestion is that these two different societies are really using apparently moral terms with different meanings. The term wrong in society A means something different to the term wrong in society B. And as a result, when somebody in society A says abortion is wrong, and somebody in society B says abortion is not wrong, they're not really disagreeing. It would be possible for both of them to be right. It'd be, it'd be like if I say the gambler's win was a fluke, meaning it was a stroke of good luck, and you say the gambler's win was not a fluke when you're using fluke to refer to the species of flatfish. Um, both statements are true. So if this kind of account of the semantics of the language is right, then the thought is this is going to show that moral values are not objective, but dependent on one's society. Now, one obvious problem with this argument is that it's hard to see exactly why the differences in the application of moral terms would make it the case that the terms are being used with different meanings. Um, you know, it seems like you're only going to get this conclusion if you assume some controversial account of moral semantics. Now, in fact, some realists do face a genuine problem here. Uh, this semantic argument is especially a challenge to some naturalist forms of realism. So see my recent video on Cornell realism, where I outline the moral twin earth objection, which is essentially a version of this semantic argument. Uh, but 
you know, it's not clear why this would be a problem for moral realism in general. Um, not all moral realists are going to accept the kind of moral semantics that the Cornell realists do. A more serious objection um, is that it's just not clear that a difference in meaning is actually incompatible with moral realism. Um, it's quite reasonable to hold both that the word wrong has different meanings in each society, but also that, say, society A is correct that abortion is objectively and universally wrong. It would just be the case that when expressing this fact to members of society B, it wouldn't be useful to translate it as abortion is wrong. Basically, the situation here is that the term wrong picks out a different property for each society. Um, but similarly, the term fluke can pick out a different thing depending on the context. I'm using it to refer to a stroke of good luck, you're using it to refer to a species of flatfish. Well, okay, so the terms there are being used with different meanings, but we still have plenty of justified true beliefs about the species of fish. It's still objectively true to say that flukes live at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe one way to put this is that what's going on here is that only one of the societies actually has a term for picking out moral properties. When society B uses the phrase morally wrong, they're not really referring to moral properties. Um, so members of society B don't really hold any moral beliefs. They can't really make any genuinely moral judgments, um, at least not until they've become acquainted with, with moral discourse. But, but that isn't a, prob a challenge to realism. You know, similarly, there could be a society that had never encountered snow and so has no concept of snow and no way of expressing beliefs about snow. It doesn't follow from this that there are no facts about snow. So it's not immediately obvious then that this semantic argument, I mean, e even if it's true um, that the term wrong would have a different meaning in each society, um, it's not clear why exactly that would be a problem for realism. At least the, uh, the anti-realist will need to do a bit more to explain exactly how we get from that claim about the divergence of meaning to um, a rejection of moral realism. A fifth argument from disagreement appeals to the absence of a method for resolving disagreements. On this view, it's not the mere existence of disagreement that creates a problem for realism, but the fact that we don't have a good method for resolving it. Uh, intuitively, at least, dis moral disagreement doesn't seem to be amenable to the uh, resolution methods that we can apply in other debates. Suppose that two biologists disagree about the truth of some hypothesis, say, concerning whether a uh, particular fossil hominid species is an ancestor of humans. Well, there will probably still be considerable agreement about what it would take to resolve their disagreement. They will agree about what kinds of evidence would solve the dispute. Uh, they'll agree about how we should go about gathering such evidence. So although there is disagreement about what the empirical facts are, um, there is agreement about the methods for adjudicating empirical disputes and about the degree to which a particular piece of evidence supports a particular hypothesis. Now, of course, there won't be perfect agreement about these matters, but there'll be enough that the dispute is resolvable in principle and probably in practice sooner or later. The worry is that moral disagreement isn't like this. So take the debate about abortion. Some aspects of this debate are relatively straightforward to resolve. Perhaps some people think that the moral status of abortion turns on the degree of brain development of the, spe of the fetus. So uh, abortion becomes impermissible when brain activity begins or something like that. Okay, in principle, that's a straightforward empirical question. But obviously much of the abortion debate isn't like this. Some people emphasize the woman's bodily autonomy, um, you know, summed up in the slogan, my body, my choice. And from this point of view, the status of the fetus is irrelevant, right? So, you know, so yes, if we all agree that abortion becomes impermissible once brain activity begins, then that's easily, that, yeah, we can resolve that empirically. But the point is, we don't all agree on that. Some people are going to emphasize bodily autonomy and say that the status of the fetus is irrelevant. Um, other people will say that, no, the fetus is, you know, an innocent human being. It has a right to life that can't be trumped by other considerations, even if it doesn't have any brain activity. Um, so, you know, we're dealing here with conflicts of rights, the right to bodily autonomy, the right to life. It's not obvious what would settle that dispute. Um, you know, it's not obvious at what point the fetus becomes worthy of moral consideration. So we don't just disagree here about what the moral facts are. We also disagree about how to resolve the disagreement.
at least it's not as obvious as, as it is in the case of the biological disagreement. So we can formalize the argument as follows. There is no method for re uh, resolving moral disputes. If there is no method for resolving a dispute about X, then we're not justified in holding beliefs about X. Therefore, we're not justified in holding moral beliefs. And that is just to say that moral realism is false. Um, now, the key question here is, how exactly are we to interpret premise one, the claim that there is no method for resolving moral disputes? Um, you know, what, does an, what would the, the anti-realist really mean when she says that there is no method for resolving moral disagreement? Um, Enoch considers several possibilities here. First, Enoch says, we might take premise one to mean that there is literally no method for resolving moral disputes. That when we have a moral dispute, we literally have no idea how to proceed. If that were true, I guess it's understandable why that might challenge realism. The problem is that it's obviously false. People do engage in moral arguments, and there are a variety of methods that they employ. They will draw on conceptual uh, analysis to make conceptual distinctions. They will use thought experiments, draw analogies. They will uh, you know, reduce opposing positions to absurdity, try to find inconsistencies. They will appeal to authority, appeal to emotion, appeal to tradition, and so on. We can certainly question whether some of these methods are legitimate. Um, presumably locating an inconsistency in your opponent's position is, epistemically speaking, a much better argument than showing that your opponent's position contradicts that of some authority figure. But it's clearly the case that we have methods for working out moral disputes, and occasionally we do manage to convince other people. So, second, we might take premise one to mean that there is no justified method for resolving moral disputes. Yes, there are plenty of ways we can go about trying to persuade other people, we can offer reasons in favour of our own views, but there's no reason to think that any of these methods are reliable, that any of them provide a good access to the facts. So there are two fairly obvious problems with premise one on this interpretation. The first is that the only people who are going to be attracted to this claim are those who already reject moral realism. Because obviously if you're a moral realist, you will think that there are justified methods for resolving moral disputes, right? So the, the anti-realist is therefore going to need to give some further argument for thinking that there are no justified methods. Um, but then notice that it will be this argument not the appeal to disagreement that is doing the real work in challenging realism. Um, indeed, disagreement actually it would be irrelevant here. Uh, even if everybody agreed on the right methods for resolving moral disputes, if we could show that none of those methods were justified, then realism would be in serious trouble. Um, so the, the argument here would then become, well, what's the argument for thinking that, no, that none of these methods that uh, people use in moral disputes are justified? Um, and then that's a separate argument. The second problem with this interpretation of premise one is that the methods that we apply to resolve moral disputes are very similar to the methods, perhaps the same as the methods, that we apply to resolve other types of disputes, uh, you know, especially within philosophy. Analogies, thought experiments, conceptual distinctions, uh, finding inconsistencies, appealing to intuition, uh, these are among the basic tools of philosophical argumentation in general. So unless the moral anti-realist wants to throw out a lot of non-moral philosophy as well, and, and probably not just philosophy, but, you know, other fields as well, uh, they're probably going to want to avoid this interpretation of premise one. So, third interpretation of premise one, we might take it to mean that there is no agreed method for resolving moral disputes. The methods for resolving disputes in biology are almost universally accepted, at least among professional biologists. Um, yeah, that's, that's the idea, right? That professional biologists just all agree on how to go about resolving disagreements, but this doesn't seem to be true for moral reasoning. Even if I have some idea what methods to use to convince others, there's not gonna be any consensus that these methods are reliable, um, that these lead to reliable beliefs. Um, this is the case, the argument would go, even among professional philosophers. So even among the experts, there's little consensus, consensus on what the appropriate moral methodology is. Um, and then a, a lack of consensus on the appropriate method is evidence that no particular method is a good guide to the truth. Uh, 
So the thought is that you know, if, if there is no agreed upon method for resolving moral disputes, no agreed upon method within the relevant professionals at least, then I have no good reason to think that my methods for developing moral beliefs are reliable. So premise one on this interpretation is not obviously true. Um, there might be rather more disagreement among biologists about what methods to apply and rather less disagreement among philosophers than it initially seems. So within biology, um, and I mean not just biology but science in general, but we'll take biology as an example. Among biology there, there are debates about the use of idealization in theoretical modeling or about the exact role and significance of simplicity as a criterion of theory choice or you know about the the um, importance of say predictive accuracy versus explanatory generality um, which are two uh, they often pull in different directions um, so different biologists will weigh different theoretical virtues in different ways um, and they will want different things out of their biological theories and among philosophers who write about ethics, um, indeed even uh, among laypersons who engage in moral arguments, there is a consensus, broadly speaking, on appropriate methods of inference. For, uh, professional philosophers agree that appealing to authority, appealing to emotion, appealing to tradition, that's of little value. Whereas uh, finding an inconsistency, uh, drawing conceptual distinctions, those things are often very useful. Um, you know, if, if you can, if somebody presents an argument, say, and then you can show that uh, there is an equivocation in the argument that you know they've conflated two different things. That's a very powerful uh, you know, reason to reject their argument. Maybe maybe you can show that a particular position rests on conflating these two different things. That's a good reason to reject it. Um, then you know something like an argument by analogy. Well, that's kind of in the middle, right? That's something that's useful when it's applied in the right kind of way and there is some consensus on what counts as a good argument from analogy and so on. So in fact there is uh, at least some agreement among philosophers about what the appropriate methods for resolving moral disputes are. Uh, so it's not obvious that premise one on this interpretation is true. Uh, there is another problem with um, this version of the the argument uh, which is pointed out by Enoch. So so on this interpretation, premise one is simply that there's no agreed method for resolving disputes, which is just to say that there is disagreement about how to resolve moral disputes. Um, and then the claim in premise two would be that the existence of this disagreement undermines the justification for moral beliefs. But now we seem to be back where we started. Uh, we asked at the beginning of this video how moral disagreement poses a problem for realism. In this argument, instead of considering moral disagreement in general, we're focusing on disagreement about moral methodology in particular. But obviously, that's just a more specific form of the general disagreement argument. Um, you know, basically, so, so to just as moral disagreement doesn't in itself entail that realism is false, neither does this more specific kind of moral disagreement, disagreement about moral methodology. Um, so the anti-realist will need some further argument which shows why disagreement in this specific sense is a problem for realism um, and it looks like it will be this argument that does the work in challenging realism. Um, yeah okay then, so a sixth argument involves the idea of rationally irresolvable disagreement. Moral disagreement is widespread um, among even among people who are very well informed and rational. Uh, it's widespread among the relevant experts. Now, the thought is that the anti-realist can grant that moral disagreement in itself is not a problem um, because there are plenty of people who are ignorant or who are just not particularly good at reasoning or have crazy beliefs that we don't need to take seriously. What makes moral disagreement a challenge is that it's persistent among the smart and the well informed. We might take this as evidence that moral disagreement is possible even among people who are ideally rational, people who make no mistakes in their reasoning, people who can be convicted of no epistemic errors may nevertheless arrive at different moral beliefs. So this argument concerns merely possible disagreement, not actual disagreement. Um, I mean to formalise it we might put it as follows, uh, where we will say that a disagreement is rationally irresolvable when ideally rational parties could continue to disagree. So, uh, 
There can be rationally irresolvable disagreement about every moral belief. If it is possible for there to be rationally irresolvable disagreement about X, then no belief about X is justified. At least it's not justified to, to accept X. So moral beliefs are not justified. Um, now, notice, of course, that premise one is a, a very strong claim. It concerns every moral judgment. But the anti-realist is going to need to say that because if only some uh, moral disagreements were, were rationally irresolvable, well, then other moral disagreements would be rationally resolvable, and presumably you could have then justified beliefs in those cases. So to get to the anti-realist conclusion, we need to suppose that all moral judgments are open to rationally irresolvable disagreement. For every moral judgment, somebody might disagree with it without making any rational error. So that's quite a strong claim. Um, is this argument convincing? Well, as Enoch says, the key question here is what exactly is involved in a rationally irresolvable disagreement. One way to interpret this idea is to say that a disagreement is rationally resolvable only if one of the parties can be shown to be logically inconsistent. So a rationally irresolvable disagreement occurs when both positions can be held without logical inconsistency. Well, on this interpretation, it's pretty plausible that moral disagreements are rationally irresolvable. Uh, you know, there are plenty of controversial moral positions that are not in themselves logically inconsistent. The trouble is that this doesn't really seem to be a challenge to realism anymore, uh, because there are plenty of crazy but logically consistent views that you could hold in just about any uh, area of science and philosophy. Uh, flat earthers are crazy, but it's possible to be a flat earther without inconsistency. It's possible to do that. On the other hand, suppose we have a very strict view of rational resolvability so that any mistake at all, in any sense, counts as a rational flaw. Uh, a disagreement is rationally resolvable whenever either party can be shown to have made any kind of error. Well, in that case, it seems that rationally irresolvable disagreement would challenge realism. But now the realist will object that moral disagreements are not rationally irresolvable. Uh, indeed, if literally any mistake at all counts as a rational flaw, then to say that moral disagreements are rationally irresolvable just begs the question against realism, because you know, for the realist, one of the positions is correct and the other isn't. Or, you know, so at most one of the positions is correct. Um, so at least one of the parties to the debate must have made a mistake of some sort if you're a realist. So on this account of rational resolvability, at least one of the parties is rationally flawed and the disagreement is rationally resolvable, according to the realist. I mean, more generally, uh, it seems like a realist can take disagreement itself as evidence of a cognitive shortcoming. Um, and, and Enoch says this is standard in other domains. Suppose that two people who are apparently epistemic peers arrive at a different result doing arithmetic. Well, in that case, we would assume that one of them has made a mistake. Or two people observing the same thing report different shapes. Again, we're going to assume that one of them has poorer vision or sees it from too great a distance or sees it in poorer lighting. So if we're moral realists, we're entitled to make the same kind of assumption about moral disputes. We're entitled to assume that the disagreement indicates that one of the parties has made a mistake and so is not ideally rational. Now, there may still be um, an explanatory challenge here. Uh, so suppose it often appears that a moral disagreement is rationally irresolvable, um, you know, it, where it sometimes appears that two people can disagree about a moral issue without either of them exhibiting any cognitive shortcomings. And suppose that this doesn't often appear to be the case in other fields, so that we rarely want to say that when two biologists disagree, neither of them has made any rational error then there appears to be a difference between moral debates and debates about other matters, and the realist will need to explain this apparent difference. The realist will need to explain why moral disagreements often appear to be rationally irresolvable, if in fact they are rationally resolvable. And, you know, it, it might be argued that the anti-realist can give a better explanation of this appearance. But then this is uh, obviously just an instance of the third argument, the inference to the best explanation that we discussed earlier. Okay then, a seventh argument. The anti-realist might use the argument from disagreement, not as a direct argument against realism, but rather as an attempt to 
undermine realist epistemology. Realists think that we have moral knowledge. Some of our moral beliefs are true and justified. So realists owe us an account of how exactly we can justify our moral beliefs. In particular, how is it exactly that moral beliefs come to track the moral facts? There doesn't seem to be any sensory connection. We don't literally see or feel the moral wrongness of an action, nor can we reveal moral wrongness by looking at things through a microscope. Uh, so, you know, how do our moral beliefs hook up to the world? Now, it's worth noting that this is a challenge regardless of moral disagreement. Even if everybody shared the same moral views, we could still ask this question. Um, and this would still be an important problem for realism, right? How exactly is it that we, that, you know, that we, we track the moral facts? Um, but disagreement does set constraints on how this question can be answered. So many, many moral uh, philosophers suppose that moral theories are judged against intuition. And a particularly popular method in moral philosophy is reflective equilibrium. Essentially, this method involves weighing our immediate moral intuitions against broader moral principles, guided by uh, general theoretical virtues such as consistency and simplicity until we achieve a coherence among all of our beliefs. So take, for example, utilitarianism. The principle that we ought to act so as to maximise happiness for the greatest number of people, that's initially very plausible as a basis for moral theorising. But we soon come across cases that seem to challenge this principle. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with things like the organ stealing case where we can save five lives by stealing the organs of one healthy person. Well, here the action which maximises happiness seems to be deeply wrong. So we have to alter our principle so as to take this into account. Um, other times we might find a case which challenges our moral principle but where our intuition is not so strong. So we're happy to dismiss the intuition. Um, and of course we want to be careful that we don't alter our moral principles too much, um, otherwise they might become you know, just too complex and unwieldy and impossible to apply or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the point is we, we're constantly adjusting our principles against our intuitions. Sometimes we you know, use the intuition to adjust the principle, sometimes we're willing to dismiss the intuition um, or just accept a counterintuitive result. Um, to try to find the moral theory which fits the most of our moral intuitions while also being simple, applicable, consistent, and so on. Now, that's, that's basically reflective equilibrium. Now, whatever you think of reflective equilibrium, it's clear enough that intuition plays a significant role here. Now, appeals to intuition are arguably undermined by disagreement. We have challenged the realist to say, to explain, why should we think that our moral beliefs track the moral facts? And if the realist's epistemology rests on an appeal to moral intuition, then uh, you know, the, the claim presumably is going to have to be that moral intuitions tend to be truth tracking, that moral intuitions tend to be reliable. But if different people have different moral intuitions, or at least if, if different people have significantly different moral intuitions, then that surely can't be right. Or at the very least, further ex explanation is required here. Um, the, the realist would perhaps have to outline the more specific circumstances in which moral intuitions are reliable. Uh, so what we have here is, it's not so much disagreement in itself that poses a challenge to realism, rather disagreement supports the epistemological challenge to realism because it undermines some of the ways that a realist might address this challenge. So we can, we can use uh, the facts of disagreement to undermine uh, realist epistemology and challenge realism in a more indirect way. Okay, let's turn to the final argument. This one isn't discussed by Enoch, but it's an interesting argument and has received some discussion in the recent literature. Uh, this argument appeals to the appropriate response to moral disagreement, um, and it's proposed by Richard Rowland in his article the intelligibility of moral intransigence. Mark Calderon, in his book on moral fictionalism, gives a similar argument, um, but we'll go with Roland's uh, statement of it. So, Roland's argument involves two basic claims. First, that moral peer intransigence is intelligible, and second, 
that peer intransigent judgments are not beliefs from these two claims. It follows that moral judgments are not beliefs. This commits us to a kind of non-cognitivism about moral judgment, which is incompatible with realism. Uh, at least non-cognitivism is prima facie incompatible with realism. Uh, it will ignore recent developments in views like quasi-realism. The point is, non-cognitivists hold that moral judgments don't even express beliefs about the world, so the question of whether moral beliefs are true or false doesn't arise. You know, the question of whether there are moral facts, mind-independent moral facts, that just doesn't arise. Okay, let's go through this argument. First, the claim that moral peer intransigence is intelligible. To say that an act is intelligible is to say that we can make sense of it. Roland asks us to consider a person who spends all day counting blades of grass, but who claims to get no pleasure from counting grass, has no desire to count grass, does not feel any obligation to count grass, and doesn't believe that counting grass is a means to achieving some other end. They spend all their time counting grass for its own sake, despite having no reason to do so, and indeed, you know, they have reasons not to do so because they could be spending their time doing things that they do enjoy. Roland says that this is an example of an act that is unintelligible. This person just doesn't seem to be acting coherently. Uh, we would have to suppose that they can't really feel and think how they claim to feel and think. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to us that somebody could be acting in this way given the um, you know, feelings and thoughts and beliefs and reasons that they have stated. Uh, so, also, uh, peerhood. Um, when I judge somebody to be my epistemic peer, I judge that they have access to pretty much the same evidence as me, uh, that they're about as intelligent as me, about as free from cognitive biases as me, and so on. Um, basically, my epistemic peers are those who are in just as good a position as I am to get the facts right. So, when we say moral peer intransigence is intelligible, that th the claim there is that it's intelligible for a person to be entirely intransigent about some moral judgment P. So, um, that is, they can judge that P with as much confidence as before, while also judging that a significant number of their epistemic peers disagree about P. And um, I see that in preparing these slides, I have used P and X, and obviously that doesn't make any sense. That should be P both times. I'm not sure why I did that. Um, so that, yeah, that, that should say, um, P1 claims that it's intelligible for a person to be intransigent about a moral judgment P while judging that some of their epistemic peers disagree about P. Yeah, that, that's a bit odd, that. I should not I should have uh, fixed that before, but oh well. Um, just have to keep that mistake in there because I can't be bothered to go back and change it now. So, uh, for instance, suppose I believe that abortion is permissible. I might then come to believe that there are a significant number of people who are just as well informed about the relevant literature as I am, and who are just as intelligent as I am, who believe that abortion is impermissible. Uh, and this need not alter my judgment about the moral status of abortion at all. Um, the fact that some of my epistemic peers disagree with me need not move me. This is at least intelligible, um, Roland suggests. And, and so why, why, why might this be intelligible? Well, what might happen in cases of moral disagreement is that I'm, I might have something like contempt for my opponent's moral sensibility. Uh, this is discussed by Mark Calderon in the first chapter of his book on moral fictionalism. He uh, recounts the political disagreement between Hilary Putnam, who's a liberal, and Robert Nozick, a libertarian. And I'm, I'm using the US senses of those terms. Calderon quotes Putnam as saying, each of us regards the other as lacking a certain kind of sensitivity and perception. To be perfectly honest, there is in each of us something akin to contempt, not for the other's mind, for we each have the highest regard for each other's minds, nor for the other as a person, for I have more respect for my colleagues' honesty, integrity, kindness, etc., than I do for that of many people who agree with my liberal political views, but for a certain complex of emotions and judgments in the other. So Putnam recognises that Nozick is his epistemic peer. Putnam also recognises that Nozick uh, has certain... that Nozick accepts certain reasons that, if compelling, would undermine Putnam's own commitment to a liberal morality. 
Um, Putnam can understand what Nozick's reasons are, he can understand why Nozick finds these reasons compelling, and he can understand exactly how these reasons support libertarianism against liberalism. But since Putnam has a kind of contempt for Nozick's moral sensibility, the mere fact that Nozick accepts such undermining reasons does not provide any reason for Putnam to reduce the confidence in his liberal judgments. And so here we have a case of moral peer intransigence. And it seems that Putnam is thinking and acting in a perfectly intelligible way. Um, I mean, bear in mind, the claim here is only that Putnam's intransigence is intelligible, uh, not that, that it's justified. We can make sense of Putnam's attitude. Putnam's attitude is at least coherent to us, even if we wouldn't approach moral disagreements in the same way. So perhaps you personally would reduce your confidence in your moral views in the face of peer disagreement, but the claim is that it's intelligible when others do not. All right, so the second premise of the argument was that peer intransigent judgments are not beliefs. Uh, that is, if I can be intransigent in my judgment that P, while recognising that many of my epistemic peers disagree about P, then P is not really a belief. And there are two points that Roland makes to defend this. First of all, Roland argues that beliefs track perceived evidence. The idea here is that when you believe that P, then if you gain new evidence that bears on P, you must adjust your judgment regarding P in light of this new evidence. Basically, you revise your beliefs to fit the new information that you acquire. Beliefs, Roland says, are transparent to the truth. The question of whether to believe that P is equivalent to the question of whether P is true. When I consider what to believe about the origin of humanity, I only think about those factors that bear on how humans arose. I only think about the evidence concerning how humans arose. Similarly, when I consider what to believe about who will win the next election, I only think about those factors that bear on who the winner will be, the evidence concerning who the winner will be. So the question, should I believe that P, and the question, should I believe that P, should I? Yeah. The question, should I believe that P, and the question, is P true, amount to the same thing, practically speaking, according to Roland. And you know, if this is right, then your belief that P will simply track your perceived evidence for P. Uh, if I believe that P and I acquire apparent evidence against P, I will either adjust my confidence in P or I will adjust my judgment about it, my, my judgment that the new information is in fact evidence against P. It is simply unintelligible, Roland says, that somebody might believe that P while also believing that the evidence does not justify their belief that P. Okay, so second uh, reason why peer intransigent judgments are not beliefs. Um, so given that beliefs track perceived evidence, we then have the claim that perceived peer disagreement counts as perceived evidence. If I believe that P, and I come to recognise that somebody who I take to be an epistemic peer believes that not P, then I have strong evidence against my belief that P. So, for example, suppose I go out to dinner with some friends and I calculate everybody's equal share of the bill, arriving at $30 each, but then my friend, who I recognise to be an epistemic peer with respect to arithmetic, tells me that she has calculated everybody's share of the bill and makes it out to be $33 each. Well, that's good evidence that my belief is wrong. I should have less confidence in my belief than I did before my friend told me their calculation. Now, if beliefs track perceived evidence, and if peer disagreement is evidence, then it follows that judgments that are intransigent to peer disagreement are not beliefs. Um, you know, because, because a belief has, because beliefs change with new evidence and peer disagreement is new evidence. So if, if you are not changing your judgment in response to peer disagreement, then it's not a belief. So that's the argument then. So again, so just to sort of spell out this argument in a bit more detail than what we originally gave, moral peer disagreement is intelligible. Um, yeah, moral judgments can be intransigent to peer disagreement. Beliefs track perceived evidence. Perceived peer disagreement is perceived evidence. So, peer intransigent judgments are not beliefs. Jud judgments that are intransigent to peer disagreement are not beliefs. So, moral judgments are not beliefs. So, realism is false. Notice that this argument doesn't depend on any empirical claims about the 
prevalence of moral disagreement. Um, even if moral disagreement were relatively rare, um, this argument could still be made because the argument rests on claims about the appropriate response to moral disagreement. Uh, so this argument is less hostage to empirical fortune than the others we have seen, uh, which seem to implicitly assume that moral disagreement is deeper or more prevalent or less open to resolution or whatever than disagreement in other domains. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, this argument might be um, sort of, you know, more, more secure uh, in that it doesn't rely on empirical claims. However, it is unsurprisingly extremely controversial. I'll just briefly note a couple of problems. Um, so, regarding the claim that beliefs track perceived evidence. Well, Arguably, there are cases where people hold beliefs beyond what they take to be determined by the evidence, or perhaps even in the face of what they take to be contrary evidence. Consider theists whose belief in God is based on something like a leap of faith, or consider the case of external world scepticism. Uh, somebody might believe that there is an external world. You know, I might believe that there is an external world, that there are tables and chairs and mountains and other people, that I'm not just hallucinating, I'm not just a brain in a vat or whatever. Um, but I might not find any of the arguments against external world scepticism particularly convincing. Um, you know, perhaps you just accept the external world for kind of pragmatic or Humean reasons. You know, I mean, that's basically what uh, what Hume said is, well, OK, we can't really defeat these arguments. But when you go out and start playing billiards or whatever with your friends, you just can't help but believe that there really is a world. Um, so, you know, <laughs> Is it, is it true that beliefs in these cases simply track the evidence? Um, that's, that doesn't seem obvious. Just more generally on this point, it's worth checking out the literature on evidentialism in epistemology. Evidentialism concerns the ethics of belief, but many of the arguments there are pertinent to this topic. Um, one obvious difficulty with the claim that beliefs track perceived evidence is that it's not actually clear what evidence is. Um, you know, what exactly counts as evidence for P? Well. I mean, here, very briefly, are some of the answers that are given on the, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on evidence. So, according to Bertrand Russell, evidence consists of sense data, mental items of consciousness with which one is immediately acquainted. Uh, according to Timothy Williamson, one's evidence consists simply of the totality of the propositions that a person knows. So, you have evidence for P when you know some set of propositions that supports P. Uh, according to certain forms of Bayesianism, evidence consists of those beliefs of which one is psychologically certain, um, and so on. Now, it's not at all clear why beliefs would necessarily track evidence in any of these senses. I mean, certainly it's, it's perfectly intelligible for somebody to believe that P while also believing that they have not experienced any sense data which support the belief that P. After all, the majority of philosophers these days reject the existence of sense data entirely. Um, so, in order to make the moral intransigence argument, we're going to need to specify exactly what definition of evidence we're using and exactly why we should think that it's necessarily the case that beliefs track evidence per that definition. Okay, as for um, the premise that perceived, that perceived peer disagreement is perceived evidence, well, again, very controversial. Check out my videos on the epistemology of disagreement for an introduction to the debate here, um, or just you know look up uh, conciliation versus steadfastness in epistemology. Uh, it's far from obvious that peer disagreement is evidence against one's beliefs, um, or it's at least far from obvious exactly what the strength of that evidence is. There's a lot of debate about this, um, so I'm not going to go into that here. I just want to flag up that that d debate exists. Okay then, well, we've now outlined um, seven forms, or was it eight forms? Well, we've outlined a number of forms of the argument from disagreement. Uh, I, I now want to, before I end, just mention two general problems for disagreement arguments. So, first of all, there is a worry that any appeal to moral disagreement will be self-undermining. There is enormous disagreement about not just morality, but about meta-ethics, indeed about philosophical topics and philosophical method in general. The same arguments um, that are used to undermine moral beliefs will also undermine meta-ethical beliefs. 
um, or at least many of those arguments used to undermine moral beliefs will undermine meta-ethical beliefs. I won't go through all of the arguments we've covered in this video, but in most cases it's fairly easy to see how they can be generalised. The argument from disagreement can be applied to challenge not just moral realism, but the argument from disagreement itself, because the argument from disagreement is itself subject to significant disagreement. Philosophers disagree significantly on just how much force it has. Um, and this is the case on many different ways of specifying the argument. So the anti-realist will need to ensure that the argument she gives avoids this problem of self-defeat. And it looks like she's going to have to do two things. First of all, identify some form or feature of disagreement that is prevalent in moral debates but that does not extend to meta-ethical and philosophical debates in general. And then second, explain why this form or feature of disagreement that is found in moral debates challenges realism while the forms and features of uh, disagreement that are found in other debates do not. Most of the arguments we've discussed in this video fail to do either of these things. Um, I mean, the, the eighth, uh, the, the, the seventh or eighth version, the last version of the argument, the moral intransigence argument, I think does do these things. But um, many of the others uh, don't, or at least it's not obvious how they do. A second general objection, an assumption that we have made throughout this discussion is that there is, in fact, a significant amount of moral disagreement. But this is controversial. Uh, the first thing to note here is that while there's certainly disagreement about specific moral judgments, say, the permissibility of abortion, that doesn't necessarily amount to genuinely moral disagreement because different moral judgments may arise from disagreement about the empirical facts. So consider, for example, somebody who believes that slavery has been ordained by God and all people will go to hell if they do not organize themselves into the uh, divinely commanded hierarchies. Or somebody who holds incorrect beliefs about the capacities of different races and so thinks that certain races are better off enslaved. Or somebody who is a utilitarian who judges that even though slavery causes lots of misery it will also maximise happiness to enslave a small proportion of people. Um, you know, if I'm in favour of abolishing slavery because I think this option will maximise happiness while my opponent is in favour of retaining slavery because he thinks that that will maximise happiness, then arguably we don't really have a moral disagreement in the relevant sense. The interesting kind of disagreement concerns disagreement about the fundamental values and norms, um, the fundamental intuitions. Uh, many, apparently, m many apparently moral disagreements are really disagreements concerning empirical beliefs. And when we consider just how substantially different the non-moral world views of different societies are, it's not surprising that we find enormous variation in the moral judgments they make. I mean, also consider the fact of the radically different circumstances of different societies. For us, infanticide is an appalling crime, but in a society where people are literally starving, where the population has already exceeded the resources and everybody knows that the life of the child would be short and miserable, um, and let's say there's, you know, death is common in that society anyway, uh, people frequently die young, um, in, that, in those sort of circumstances infanticide might be favoured. Um, it, it may be the case that uh, we have simply failed to adequately understand the circumstances in which some people live. Um, I mean, like we mentioned earlier, it can be hard to put oneself in the shoes of others. When we see certain cultures practising infanticide and interpret that as a radical moral um, disagreement, uh, it, that might not actually be the case. It might be the case that if we were in those same circumstances, if, if our circumstances changed and we ended up in that situation, we might be able to see that actually this apparently appalling practice is justified on the basis of norms that we also accept, perhaps. Um, some specific evidence for widespread moral agreement is given by Hanno, um, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce this dude's name, Hanno Sawyer, I'm going to say, in his article, The Argument from Agreement. So, <clears throat> first of all, consider debates about ethics within philosophy. Well, here we find philosophers accepting different normative theories, uh, consequentialists, Kantians, virtue theorists, contractarians, and so on. But notice that these philosophers tend to share moral concerns and they tend to substantially agree in their 
moral intuitions. They disagree about which theory provides the simplest or the most plausible foundation for accommodating those intuitions. Um, for example, we might be tempted to consequentialism because we can't make sense of the idea of foundational rights. Um, you know, but we might share the basic intuitions that lead people to believe in moral rights. Uh, and also, as Sawyer points out, it's rather surprising that at a basic level, there are only three or four broad normative theories that have commanded widespread assent. Um, like, you know, you, okay, consequentialism, deontology, virtue theory, contractarianism. I mean, there are, there are others, but they seem to be like elaborations of these, you know. There are a relatively small number of higher level normative theories that philosophers um, have explored. And, and these theories are themselves basically just elaborations of tendencies that are already present within common sense morality. Most people who think in moral terms uh, will care about reducing harm and promoting pleasure, or they'll think about you know, rights as constraints on actions, or they'll apply virtue theoretic language or whatever. So now let's turn to the uh, anthropological evidence concerning cross-cultural disagreement. Sawyer says there is, broadly speaking, agreement on the basic moral values. Um, inflicting pain on others is bad. Cooperation with others is good. Cheaters ought to be sanctioned. Altruists ought to be rewarded. The possessions of others ought to be respected. These are the fundamental values that you can find in almost every culture. Now, of course, some cultures are more violent, some more prone to selfishness, less cooperative, and so on than others. Um, there's disagreement about how to weigh these basic values against each other. Some cultures strongly emphasise personal property so that it's considered acceptable to kill trespassers in defence of one's property rights. Uh, in other cultures, human life is valued much more strongly than you know, property, etc. But the point is that in everyday interactions, almost all cu cultures will abide by certain basic norms. Um, so Sawyer appeals to evidence showing that morality arises to promote social cooperation. Uh, so cooper cooperation and the behaviours that promote cooperation with others in one's society are universally taken to be morally good. Um, here he cites the work of Oliver Curry, who distinguishes seven cooperative strategies. These are the seven cooperative strategies. Curry examined 500 ethnographic records of 60 different societies and found that in over 99% of cases, the cooperative strategies here are considered morally good. Uh, so I also notes the work by Jonathan Haidt uh, on moral foundations. Haidt lists six moral foundations. Different people will assign more or less importance to the different foundations. So, um, for example, liberals in the US sense of the term tend to strongly emphasize care and fairness, and they tend to mildly emphasize liberty and have relatively little concern for the three others. Conservatives tend to value all six about equally. Libertarians strongly emphasize liberty and have less concern for all of the others. Um, I mean, this might initially appear to be a case of disagreement, but what's striking about this is that almost all people's moral views are structured around these basic values. There are differences in emphasis. Um, some people emphasize care and fairness. Other people emphasize authority and sanctity. Um, and similarly, different people will understand these concepts in different ways. So in one society, fairness might dictate splitting the cake 50-50, in another it dictates giving only one third of the cake to the other person. But almost all groups, almost all cultures, display a general sensitivity to all six of these moral foundations, and reasoning using these six values plays a central role in almost all cultures. Now, Sawyer's point is not to defend either Curry or Height in particular. What matters is simply that, according to Sawyer, something like one of these theories is probably correct. There are probably certain general moral values that are shared by almost all cultures. Uh, Sawyer says that even the most significant moral disagreements are not really that radical when you consider the logically possible space of positions. It would be possible, in principle, for a culture to think that harming others is good and cooperation is bad. It would be possible for a culture to think that jumping on the spot for one hour a day is morally obligatory. Not for any further reason, just because, you know, they just they just want to. Not, not because uh, God has instructed that this is a ritual that people must perform. Um, they, they just might 
take it as a foundational moral value that jumping on the spot is good. Or they might think that, um, they might think that the colour blue is morally bad. Um, again, just in itself, not for any further reason. And so they go about removing or repainting blue things. Or they might think that laughter and humour is the only thing of intrinsic value and structure their society around promoting comedy. In the real world, we don't find disagreements anything like this. Real moral disagreement is heavily constrained, and it's built around the kind of values identified by Curry and Height. Now contrast this to disagreement about empirical matters, such as disagreement about the origin of the Earth. Some people think that the Earth was created in six days by an immaterial, omnipotent, omniscient, conscious creator. Some people think that the Earth is eternal, that the cosmos cycles endlessly through the different stages of development. Some people think that it was born from a giant animal. Some people think it condensed from the random movements of atoms in a void, and so on. With respect to the question of the origin of the Earth, we find people exploring an extraordinarily broad region of conceptual space. And nobody really came close to the right answer until, you know, the development of, of like science and sophisticated instruments and sophisticated theories. Um, so the the suggestion then is well, moral disagreement is is actually not as prevalent as we might initially have thought. That there is, uh, although although people do differ in terms of the specific moral judgments that they make, this often arises from uh, disagreement about empirical um, matters and. Actually, on a foundational level, societies tend to structure their moral thinking around the same kinds of values. Um, so, uh, well, that was the, 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 the argument from moral disagreement. That's all I have to say. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.